गुरुर् ब्रह्मा गुरुर् विष्णु गुरुरेव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पार ब्रह्म तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः हेलो एवरीबॉडी आई वुड लाइक टू रीड टू यू फ्रॉम अ बुक दैट आई हैव जस्ट पब्लिश्ड कॉल्ड कन्वर्सेशंस विद योगनंदा योगनंदा एज यू हर्ड एज यू नो was the author of autobiography of a yogi i lived with him for three and a half years the last three and a half years of his life and i would like to read and then comment on some of these things the first thing is a professor from columbia university came to lunch with the master in his third floor interview room at mount washington I served them and was able afterward to sit in the room and take notes while they conversed. At a certain point in their discussion the professor asked, "Do your teachings help people to be at peace with themselves?" "They do indeed," the master answered, "but that is the least that they do. We teach people above all how to be at peace with their creator." Now Most people in the world today in today's society are trying to find how to be at peace with themselves and for that reason they don't find peace you find this was in fact the mistake i made for many years i was trying to find peace of mind understanding without god i thought i would find it in perfect politics in perfect art in perfect science in perfect literature in perfect music no word that i find it it just didn't exist until i suddenly woke up one morning and realized that without god life didn't really have any meaning to be at peace with the creator is just about the last thing that most systems today try to give to us they try to say for example communism a good, good example because they don't even believe in god and so they say that the more perfect our system the more we will have of what we want as a society but you can never have a perfect system so the only way to imagine creating that kind of perfection is to kill off everybody who disagrees with you well this seems to be the way of much of modern society if it doesn't fit lop off like the old procrustean uh, story of theseus back in the greek days procrustes was a man who was a tyrant and a villain and he had a very special bed when he entertained guests then he would bed them down in a special bed that he created and if they were too long for the bed then he would just bind them to the bed lop off their legs and let them bleed bleed to death and he had a great time if they were too short he would stretch them until they screaming in agony agony were long enough for the bed well of course all those old greek stories were really allegories they were intended to mean something more this is what people do with logic if logic doesn't apply to the facts well sort of bend the facts a little bit to fit the logic if reality doesn't fit your theories well just sort of bend reality to fit the theories but life goes on as it is and we've got to learn this is one of the wonderful things that i have seen in the philosophy of india it's realistic it doesn't pose theories to life it poses the reality it says what is life what does life ask of us what are the realities and then try to work within that framework well the difficulty with that and logic is that logic is nice and fixed and framed whereas logic i mean reality is always sort of uh, um well it's flexible it breathes it's a, it's a living thing and you cannot say from one day to the next that it has to be or will be this way or that way Now in this thing here Yogananda is teaching a basic teaching of his which he came to the west to bring how to be in tune 
how to be at peace with a much larger reality. We are all a part of that reality. We don't have a separate reality. We are a part of the infinite ocean. And an image that he often used was the waves and the ocean. We are like waves on that ocean. The ocean is constant. The waves are very inconstant. Our job as human beings is to understand that we are a part of that much greater reality. As long as we try to live separate from one another, and this is how you see most people are in daily life, they, they look at one another and try, they try to relate to people as they think they ought to be, for example. This, of course, is one of the problems in human existence. The reason people don't find happiness in life is because they place conditions on it. They say that, well, why can't it be this way? Why can't that person be the way I want him to be? How can the world be made in the image I want it to be? Well, it isn't. We have to learn to adjust to the world. We are uh, just a part of a much larger scene. And you will see that most people, when you talk to them, they're always talking from their own reality. They don't even communicate. They're always talking about what they think, what they think you ought to be. If only you were this way, why, don't, why aren't you that way? Why can't you see my point of view? It would be very good to learn to listen to a larger reality. We are a part of the universe. We are a part of the infinite flow of time. Now, this is one of the wonderful things that I learned sitting at the feet of my guru. I used to be a very arrogant young man. And I used to think that the world had to fit into my little theories. And I found that it didn't. I found that life went on on its own way and people were what they were. And as a result, I often got upset, got upset with other people, got upset with life, got upset with why are things this way, why can't they be that way. Bit by bit, I learned that life just is. Now, how do we get to learn to know how to be a part of that greater reality? How do we become a part of that infinite peace? How do we make peace with the universe? and with our Creator. Well, that's what he came to teach. He came to teach us how to meditate. He came to teach us how to listen. How to listen, first of all, to God. Yes, God has a sound. It's not as if he were up there speaking in the clouds. But there is an ohm sound, the infinite vibration of the universe that we are a part of. And in deep meditation, or, you know, if you go into a quiet place in the countryside, let's say, where there's not a sound anywhere, you can hear sometimes a sort of a still hush. And behind, behind that stillness, you begin to hear a sound, maybe a deep roar, maybe a sound like, <coughs> oh, like wind in the trees, or it's, it's a sound underneath everything. That sound which, if you could eliminate every sound in the universe, every sound in the world around you, I should say, you would hear that sound, and it's talking to you. There is a way to learn to communicate by listening quietly in deep meditation, closing your ears, listening to the inner sound in the right ear. You can begin to hear that the voice of God, the presence of God, is very real. And as you listen to that sound more deeply, you begin to feel that there are many, many different levels of reality of which all of us are a part. These levels of reality are within ourselves, yes, because first of all, when you quiet your mind, you find that the mind is not anything but quiet. It makes a lot of hubbub. But bit by bit, as you quiet the mind, you begin to feel that there's a peace welling up inside you. 
You know, when I first sat to meditate, I didn't know what it was all about. I just wanted God. And I figured, well, if that's the way to do it, I'll do it. But I discovered in time that there's a reality inside. You know, I wouldn't leave meditation for anything in the world. It's the most wonderful thing there is. Just getting to know who you really are. Because, you know, the joke of it is that as you get to be in, at, uh, learn to be at peace with your Creator, you do become at peace with your own higher self. When Yogananda said that we try not just to be at peace with ourselves, but with the, with the infinite, with the Creator, what he was saying is we need to be at peace with our own higher self. We were made from that self. We are not this ego. We are not this body and this personality. These are a false self. Think of the universe as, well, like that ocean. The ocean is one. But as it spews, as it waves, as it begins to heave and create all these different waves, the waves can be symbolic either of human beings and all these little egos trying to push away from the ocean floor, from the ocean bosom, or we can also think of them as the waves of our own consciousness, our own restless thoughts. Both are valid. Once those waves become calm, then you become aware of the great vastness of the sea beneath us. You know, when I was a child, I used to because although I'm an American, I was born in Romania. And I wasn't born a Romanian, I was born an American. But my father was a geologist in Romania, and so every three years or so, he would get a vacation in America, and we would go by ship, which is the way people traveled in those days. And uh, going on the ship on the sea for five days, oh, I remember what a thrill it was the vastness of the water, that underneath all those waves, this vast ocean, this is what God is. This is what we are if we can get away from our little preoccupations. If we can get away from this thought that I want this and I want to do that. Meditation helps to eliminate that ego, helps to eliminate that personal preoccupation that says I want all these things. If you can really get rid of your separateness. If you can get rid of your feeling of separateness from other people, if you can get rid of your separateness of different states of consciousness, so that you don't feel moody one way a day, up one day, you're always the same. These are the goal of yoga, not to make you dull or apathetic. The goal of yoga is to help you to see, be so calm that sort of like when a lake is calm, it's able to see the moon reflected in the water. Similarly, when the mind is calm, then it begins to perceive the higher realities in the world around it and in the universe. You know, this is the secret of human living also. That if you want to know what the world is, you've got to calm your mind. You can't be making a loud noise all the time. The more quiet you are, the more ready you are to listen. There's a story of a man in Bengal in Calcutta. You know, Calcutta people like to talk a lot. And he was saying one day to a young man, my boy, are you married? The young man said, what do you mean am I married? I'm married to your own daughter. Oh, yes, yes, I know, I know that. I just wanted something to say and couldn't think of anything else. Well, you know, when you're so busy wanting something to say that you can't, you just have to say something even if it makes no sense, then you're not going to hear what's going on in life. You know, the great scientists, to a large extent, are yogis because they listen. They don't try to create what the world ought to be. They try to observe what it really is. And granted, they make the mistake of thinking they can reason it out. They can find truth by creating it. A true yogi is even better than that. A true yogi calms his mind 
and simply perceives. This is what I saw in my great guru. He perceived, and in that perception, he knew my every thought. In that perception, he knew my very feelings. One time he said to somebody, you have a sour taste in your mouth, haven't you? She said, well, how did you know? He said, because I'm as much in your body as I'm in this body. A great yogi isn't limited by his ego. A great yogi isn't limited by any sense of separation from the rest of life. So when I say, and when I, I'm quoting him and saying, that we teach people how to be at peace with their creator, what we're helping them to do is to eliminate the agitation in their own minds, and in that calmness that ensues, you begin to perceive the reality of things as they are, the presence of God as he is. It's not a delusion. It is a perception of reality itself. What is love? Is it love? 